All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Bob Cornell with you and uh, coming to you live from my porch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, right here in the Nashville, Tennessee area. And it's a joy. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, tonight we're just going to get right into uh, the word of God. And uh, this tonight, this is a, uh, you could say a, vir a virtual church for our uh, what we would normally have at Covenant Church, our Tuesday evening Bible studies. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, gathering, gathering together again whenever that happens. And hopefully that can happen in the month of May. But uh, looking forward to that. But uh, tonight we're going to get right into God's Word. And last week uh, I started in, in Romans chapter 8 and we studied verse 1. And I felt led of the Lord uh, this week to just continue in verse 2. So in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, so this is what Paul wrote. He said, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Then he said this in verse 2, and this is what we're, what we're going to be studying. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free free from the law of sin and death. Well, that's a good verse right there. I'm going to read it again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so we're going to talk about verse two tonight and those that law and that uh, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death that Paul talked about in this verse. And we're going to deal with that tonight, but let's pray uh, real quick as we begin tonight. Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for everyone who's watching right now and will watch later. God, we ask you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come and move upon myself, Lord. Give me liberty, the right words to say, Lord, tonight in the name of Jesus. And Lord, let your anointing touch those who are watching Lord, minister to them. Let your word be made real by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let it, became, let it become real tonight in the name of Jesus. And we say it all in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, last week, as we uh, just quickly in review, Paul, Paul wrote to the Romans, and this is in context of, of Romans chapter 7, and really the whole context of, of the book of Romans. But he said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, uh, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And Paul, he said, he, he mentioned that there, and he emphasized that point, there's no condemnation. Just quickly in review, what that meant is, what Paul was meaning is there is no death sentence over a child of God. Why? It's because they are in Christ Jesus. And what does that mean to be in Christ? It means that the moment you and I accepted Christ by faith into our hearts, whenever that was, and just think about your own life for a moment, whenever you accepted Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit took you back 2,000 years ago and placed you in Christ, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. And what, what, what part of you, the, Paul said it in Romans chapter 6, and verse 6, it's the old you. He placed the old you and crucified him and put him, put him in the grave. And a new you rose with Christ. And now you're a new creation in Christ uh, Jesus. And so uh, because of that, there's no death sentence over your life. Why? It's because Christ took your death sentence on the cross. Christ took your guilt upon the cross. You were guilty. Christ was not guilty. He was sinless. Paul wrote in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, he said that for, he, for, for God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us or a sin offering for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's what God did for us through Christ's death the cross. Christ took our sin. He took our penalty. He took everything, the penalty, the power, the pleasure. He took, the pre he took it all upon himself, upon the cross. And he said right before he died, it is finished. 
That was a statement of victory, not a statement of, of defeat, but a statement of victory upon the cross. And as I've, I've ministered before, uh, Jesus made seven statements on the cross. But the statement I believe that he made to all of mankind was that sixth statement, it is finished. He might have, that might have been the seventh statement, but I believe it was the sixth statement. It is finished. He said it to all of mankind, meaning that I have paid your sin debt. Hallelujah. I've paid it. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so all those who are in Christ, there is no death sentence. And praise God for that. And we are to walk by faith in that finished work and what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. He, he fulfilled the law on our behalf. We couldn't do it, but he did. Through his perfect birth, his perfect life, and ultimately, ultimately him being the Lamb of God and dying the perfect death in our place. He did it, he, and he did, uh, he did it for us at the cross. And so we are to live by faith in that. That's what it means, really, to walk in the Spirit. It's walking dependent upon Jesus' work and not our own work. As I've said last uh, week and when I ministered in Romans 8, 1, true biblical Christianity and our relationship with God is all about being uh, it all about Christ, uh, uh, the righteousness of God being done, done, done by Jesus. It's not a doing, doing, doing relationship with God or God, I got to do more to be right with you. But God, man, that, that's not God. So many believers have that mindset about God that he's looking down from heaven, just looking down at us saying, okay, I want you to do more, do more, do more. And, I'll, and, and finally, at some point, You'll be right with me. You'll make me happy or I'll, I'll love you. At some point, if you just do more, I'll love you. Tell you, that's not your heavenly father. Your heavenly father is not looking down from heaven with some smirk on his face, looking at you and just demand, just, and just thinking about you. His mindset about you is not thinking, oh, I just wish they would do some more and then I could really love them. No, that's not God. God loves you. He manifested it at the cross. And the fact that you accept his love for you, now you can experience that love. Hallelujah. You can experience that victory over sin because you believe what God is wanting more than anything, what he requires, what he demands more, really what he, more than anything is that you just believe and you trust. And we depend upon him on a daily basis. That's what God's requiring. That's what God's looking for us, is that we keep trusting in Him and, and knowing what He did for us at the cross. That his, that his death, burial, and resurrection defines who we are in, this, in 2020, in this modern age of technology in this modern age of intellectualism in this modern age of you know quote evolution and we're evolving into you know better people i don't i don't think so we're not evolving society may be evolving but it's not evolving getting better society is getting worse why why do i say that because the bible says that but our identity as a child of god is not in our and not not in society our identity is not in our doing what we can do our identity in is found in what jesus has already done for us at the cross hallelujah we are crucified buried and resurrected with christ you know i uh, i want to chase a rabbit here but it's a good rabbit it's it's in line here with freedom i was thinking i was getting ready for uh this passage tonight and teaching on it and uh i was thinking about how the I hear so much, and I've heard about it for many years, and I'm sure you've heard it as well. But I, I hear so much uh, in the world, and even in the church as well, about you know I, uh, about you just being you, and uh, that if you, it's almost like if you want freedom, find out who you are, and then you just be you. And then by you being you, by you discovering you, 
That's what brings freedom. Do you know, you know what I'm talking about? It's, it's that mindset today. And, and I, you know what? I totally get it that, that we are, we need to know our purpose. We, we need to know that we have a purpose in life and we need to know that we have value. Uh, uh, we need to know, we need to know that. But in the world, they're trying to find that freedom and find to find, find that value in themselves. Follow your own heart. You've probably heard that a million times. Follow your own heart. And you just be you. Be and you just, you know, have some all that all that, that, that thinking. And you know what? Again, they're, they're, that thinking is correct when it's connected to God's plan for you. When it's connected to what the Bible says about us. Yes, God's plan for us is to be free, but our freedom is not in discovering who we are. Our freedom is in discovering God's plan. Our, our freedom is found in Christ. Jesus said it in, in John chapter 8 and verse 32. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Then he would say in verse 30, 30, uh, what is it, 36, he said, Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Our freedom's not found in us. Our freedom is found outside of us in Jesus. And so if you want to be the best you, it's found only in Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Boy, that's good. I want to say it again. If you want to find the the, the best you that there is, it's found in you finding yourself in Christ, knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul was dealing with here in Romans chapter 8. First of all, there's no condemnation in Christ. There's no death sentence. Why? It's because Christ loved us so much. He took it on your behalf. Boy, that's, that's, that's life. That's liberty right there. And then he would say here in verse 2, he would add to it. He, he would say, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So you'll notice that both in verse 1 and in verse 2, in verse 1 there's no condemnation. Where? In Christ Jesus. In verse 2, where is their life? Where is the spirit of life? It's in Christ Jesus. And specifically, he talked about a spiritual law. He said, in Christ Jesus, there is this law of the spirit of life. And technically, you could say it's the law of of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul talked about this is the first time he's ever mentioned this spiritual law in all of his all of his epistles that he wrote. It's the only time he ever mentioned this law this way, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, we have to take everything in context. If we're to interpret the Bible correctly, we have to interpret it in its context. So, in the context of Romans, real quickly, in Romans 1, chapter 1 through chapter 5, Paul, what Paul outlined was he outlined this, that all men are sinners. All are sinners. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But also in Romans 1 through 5, what Paul established is that we are justified by faith and not by the law. We're justified by faith. So number one, we're all sinners before God. Sin is disobedience before God. And that we are justified, we are made righteous in the eyes of God Legally, we're justified by faith alone, just like Abraham. Abraham, in, in Romans chapter 3, Paul quoted uh, Genesis chapter five and 15 and verse 6. For, for Abraham believed and he was accounted unto him for righteousness. So that's what Paul established in Romans 1, chapters 1 through 5. And then in chapter 6, he starts talking about sanctification. And in chapter 6 through 8, 
He's dealing with sanctification. And in chapter 6, real quickly, he dealt with our identification, that when Christ died, as I've already said, when he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. And when he rose from the dead, we rose from the dead. And that is where the power of the sin nature is broken through our believing and our identification with Christ. That he not only died for us, not only did he do something for us, for us but he did something to us and that what was that he we were crucified with him buried ro risen from the dead now in chapter 7 what paul talked about is that he he wrote about that that uh and he gave his own personal example that uh, of his own life that early on in his christian life he tried to use the law of god and that was the Old Testament law, specifically the Ten Commandments. Specifically, he mentioned, uh, uh, thou shalt not covet. He mentioned that one, which really means thou shalt not have evil desires. <laughs> that pretty much leaves everyone, that, that, that affects everybody. Thou shalt not have evil desires. And Paul said in Romans 7 that he found himself, and he, as a child of God, in Romans chapter 7, let me just say this. Romans chapter 7 is not describing Paul before he was saved as an unsaved person trying to get victory over sin. That does not describe Paul in his pre-conversion mindset. And just to prove it in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul said concerning the law, and he, he, was, he was talking about his pre-conversion attitude and mindset, he said, concerning the law or the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. At least that was, that's what his mindset was. Before Paul was saved, his mindset was concerning righteousness. I was blameless, man. I, I was doing it all, doing it all right. Well, in Romans chapter 7, he, that's not describing Paul doing it all right. Actually, he describes Paul wanting to do right but he kept finding himself doing wrong and in a nutshell paul what he describes in romans 7 is that he tried to use the law the ten commandments and really that which were that was the moral uh requirements of god put god first don't make idols and you know, all the ten command uh, uh Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt honor your father and mother, thou shalt not lie. And then he used, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not have evil desires. And he tried to use the law in a way that God never intended for it to be used, and that was to get victory over the sin nature. And what Paul found in Romans chapter 7, and we discover it, or I encourage you to read it, Paul discovered that, that when he tried to get victory over the power of the sin nature that was within him by the means of law, he actually found sin nature actually getting worse and the, and the evil desires getting worse. And there was a revival of the sin nature. He said, sin revived and I died. It didn't mean he lost his salvation, but death means separation from life. It just means that there, the, the, he was still saved, but, but boy, the, the grace of God and the life of God in him, the Holy Spirit was frustrated because he was trying to be victorious and have life the wrong way. And that was by the means of the law. And Paul would say, it were right, I keep on saying that, Paul would write, in Galatians chapter 5 and uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, he said, But I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. And you could say it this way, and it, this is what he discovered in Romans chapter 7, that if victory comes by law, then Christ died in vain. And he realized that his victory was not in himself keeping the law. He found he realized that his victory over the power of sin, the sin nature within him, was found only in what Jesus did for him at the cross. It was found in 
Christ Jesus. I want to say it again. Again, what he found is that his victory over the power of sin was found in Christ Jesus. And when Paul used that little statement, in Christ Jesus, or any variation of it, in Christ or in him, he, it, it meant who Christ was, that he was a son of God, and it meant all that Christ accomplished for us at Calvary. In him, in Christ, is a loaded statement. That means everything about Christ, everything, who he is, everything that he did for us, again, ultimately, by what he did for us at Calvary. And so Paul found that his victory over sin was found in what Christ did for him at the cross. And he realized that, boy, in Christ, there's no condemnation. The guilty sentence is over with. <laughs> and he realized also this that there's a spiritual law that sets us free from the law of sin and death. And he said, that law is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, I wanna, I wanna read, I just wanna give this, give this to you. Well, because some would, as I was studying this, I thought, you know, this is just one of those passages that I, and this is not demeaning, I think it's just the condition of so many believers, so many Christians. This is just one of those passages that so many Christians, when they read it, they, they, they might get, you know, the gist of freedom from sin from it. They might get that from this verse in verse two, but the details of it, or really, the, uh, what Paul meant by it, they, they really don't get it. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I believe most Christians, when they read that, they have no idea what that, what the law of the spirit of life in Christ, what that really, what that means, or even the law of sin and death, what that means. But let me, let me give this to you in a nutshell, because Paul, in this passage, he really didn't give a technical or uh, lexical definition for what the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus was. But in an essence, in, 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 a, in, a, uh, in, in its basic uh, definition, I believe he did. And it's, and it's basically this. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in a nutshell, is a spiritual law, is a spiritual law that by which we receive everything that Christ died on the cross for. Let me, let me say it a little bit different. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the spiritual law by which we receive all the benefits of what Christ died for on the cross. Again, it's the spiritual law by which we receive all the benefits of, of what Christ died on the cross for. All the benefits, everything that Christ died for, Everything, life, love, freedom from sin, uh, freedom from the power of sin, freedom from the penalty of sin, freedom from the pleasure of sin, freedom from the presence of sin. It's all through, it's received all through the spiritual law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And you see, what, what Paul was getting at is this, is that God, God works by law, but it's not, God doesn't give us victory. He doesn't give us freedom from sin by the, by the, the, the 10 commandments, by the old Testament law. He gives us freedom from sin by a different law, by a spiritual law that was really, that was established by God to us. That's what that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus really is. Let me, let me say it this way. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is this. It's the spiritual law established through the cross that enables the spirit to give life to the believer and establishes the limits or boundaries by which the spirit of God works in the believer. Let me say that again. It's a, it's a mouthful, so let me say it again. 
the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It is a spiritual law established by God through the cross. Again, that's, that's not a wooden be the wood or whatever. That's through, through Christ's death at the cross. That spiritual life that God established through the cross that enables the Holy Spirit to give life to us. And it also establishes the boundaries by which the Spirit works. So, get this. Just like any law, so with this law. A law, any law, law it, it, it can enable you. It gives you certain rights. And a law also establishes boundaries. That's what the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus does. It enables it's a, when you follow that law, whenever when anybody, if they follow that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, it enables it like it opens the door for the Holy Spirit to move and bring life, the very life of God into your being. But also with that law is boundaries, just like any law, just like a speed limit law. Use that as a, as a simple one. A speed limit law, it establishes boundaries. 70 miles an hour, you shall not go past 70 miles an hour. It's a law. A law establishes boundaries. So, see, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, what are the boundaries of that law? The boundaries of that law are found in the words, in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. So, the, so what, what does that mean? It means this. It means the Spirit of God gives life within the boundaries of in Christ Jesus. That means who He is, the truth of who He is, and what He has accomplished for us at the cross. That is the spiritual boundaries by which the Holy Spirit works. And there's one requirement. There's one requirement. Just like, and notice it's not the laws, plural, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's the law. And there's one requirement for that law. And that law, that requirement, I should say, that requirement is is. Let me let me say let me let me say it this way. How did we get in Christ Jesus to begin with? We got in Christ Jesus to begin with by trusting in him, by faith. And so the main requirement, really the one requirement of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that will set you free, that will make you free from the law of sin and death is that we trust, that we believe. And that's not easy believism. But that because Paul would say this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. He would say, for in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God, what that means what's right with God, is revealed from faith to faith, from the beginning point of faith to the ending point of faith, from the beginning point of our Christian life to the very end of our life. The righteousness of God is being continually revealed in the gospel. And that's in Christ's death and resurrection for us. Amen. It's by being constantly revealed. And he said this, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What is God requiring of, of us? He's requiring of us initially that we believe. What's he requiring of us now? That we live by the faith, same faith that we started out with. Paul said it, he said it this way, he wrote it this way in Colossians 2 and verse 6. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. That's what God's requiring. He's at, he's requiring, that's what, that's what God is, is more than anything. He allows trials in our life. He allows things to happen in our life. Why? It's so that we would, would draw closer to him in our relationship by trusting in him more. That we would go to his word that we would go to his word and find out more 
of who he has made us, of who we are in Christ Jesus. That we would go to his word and find out more of what it means to be in Christ Jesus. That we would go to his word, that we would go to him in prayer. That we would seek his face and find out more of him, of who he is and what he's done. That we would trust in him more. You see, that's what God's looking for. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is that, that, that law, that spirit of life. It's a spiritual law. You believe, we believe, and it's, again, it, it's, it's a law. The Spirit of God will give life to us. And some might say, well, you know what? I, I don't feel that life. Or sometimes you feel frustrated in your walk with God. Or you say, you know what, Brother Bob, I, I agree 110% with what you're saying. And I believe that. I put my faith and I, and I live by faith in what Christ has done for me at Calvary. I live, that's what I do, but I, I just feel frustrated or, brother, or I still have this sin in my life. I still got this. I still have that. Get this. Just because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is being made real to you and the spirit of God is there. He's in, he's in your life. He's in your life and he's giving life. Believe me, he's giving life. I'll say it this way, a bad day in Christ is a whole lot better than a good day out of Christ. It's better to be in trouble in Christ than to be in trouble out of Christ. And you're in Christ still. Just, to, just think of it still. Yeah, I, you got all the, the, I tell you, the devil and our own flesh and even other people are professionals at getting us to focus on what we don't have. Versus what we do have in Christ. That's what we're to focus on. What we have in Christ. And we have everything in Christ. We have life. We have liberty. We have victory. As Paul would say in this passage, he said we have freedom. But again, you might be in that place tonight where you say, I, I just don't feel that freedom. And I just want to encourage you tonight that Freedom is much more than a feeling. Yeah, it involves a feeling. It involves a feeling because there is no greater feeling than being free. No greater feeling than being free. And, and, and when you know the sin, you, when you know the person that you used to be without Christ, when you know that old person compared to who Christ has made you, you know you, that that's freedom. You know freedom. Or you know the person that you would be right now without Jesus. That's freedom. <laughs> that's freedom. There's nothing better than just knowing that you're free. And yes, for feeling there is a feeling in freedom, but freedom is so much more than a feeling because freedom, well, the feeling of freedom will not always be there. But when the feeling of freedom is not there, that's when you have to know. That's when real, that's when faith kicks in because faith isn't a feeling. Yeah, there's feelings involved in it because we're made in the image of God. And because of that, we have feelings. God has feelings. We have feelings. We have emotions. But when the feeling of faith is not there, when the feeling of freedom is not there, you have to know. You have to know it. And again, that's real faith. Knowing it. Knowing and believing. God's word says I'm free. Hallelujah. Christ made me free at the cross. And I am free. And you can declare it. And your freedom's not in your declaring. But the Bible says that faith speaks. And you could say it. I'm free. I'm free in Christ. Can I tell you this? I can be real, be, be very real with you. Even after you fail, the moment after you fail, by faith you can declare, you know what? In Christ, I am free from this thing. This sin does not define who I am. 
Christ defines who I am. And I just want to encourage you tonight. That sin that you may have, whatever it is, it may be one of the major bond, you know, the, the big five or the big things that we think of. It could be drinking, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be sexual immorality, it could be gambling, it could be greed, it could be lying. It can just be fear, it could be fear. You're paranoid. You find yourself in this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, you, you find yourself not just fearful, but you find yourself, I mean, paranoid. That's a bondage. Paranoia is a bondage. And maybe tonight you might find yourself in that place of paranoia about what's going to happen. What's going to happen in society? What's going to happen because this whole COVID-19 thing? And you're absolutely captive by paranoia to it. I tell you, you're, you are free. In Christ, you're free. You don't find that paranoia in Christ. You don't find that bondage in Christ. That paranoia does not define who you are. Christ defines who you are. So I encourage you tonight, get your eyes off and get your mind, get your, get your, your faith fixed, your dependence fixed upon Jesus. The freedom that you have in Christ. Hallelujah. And there is no paranoia in Christ. In Christ, you are free from drugs. In Christ, you are free from that nicotine. In Christ, you are free from religion. Being bound by do's and don'ts. Or, you, let me say it this way, in Christ, you are free from the law of you. I'm going to live life my way. Yeah, you're free from that too. Because true living is not living life your way. True living is living life God's way. In Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Mm. Freedom is, means to liberate. It means to take the shackles off. I'll never forget years ago battling with uh, having a battling with uh, a sin. Oh, and and I remember one uh, one night, the, the Lord, as I, I think I was in prayer, actually. I might not have been. I don't know. But I remember the Lord showing me, just gave me a vision because I, I was awake. And in my vision, I just saw my hands with hand and like a ball and chain, like a like the old, old medieval type of, you know, uh, ch a chain. There. I, I saw my hands in it. In bondage to sin. But that I saw those chains and the shackles just break off of me. I saw it. And it was like God, I knew it, it was like God was telling me, you're free. In me, you are free. Through what I did for you, you are free. And that's what you need to believe tonight. That's what you need to know. Know it. If you don't feel it, know it. And the feeling will come. And re even remind yourself, remind God. God wants you to even to remind him of how free he has made you. That actually gives glory to the Lord when you remind him, God, you've made me free through the blood of Christ. I'm free in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. God, you've made me free. That gives God glory. Hallelujah. That gives pleasure to God when we remind him of what he's done for us. Mm, hallelujah. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. He's liberated me. Doesn't mean I don't still sin. Yeah, but but there's no more. The, the penalty's gone. No more guilty sentence. No more death sentence over my life. The power of sin will be broken, is broken. The pleasure of sin is broken. That's a big one right there. Even the pleasure of it. Thank God that through what Christ has done for us and his indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there's no pleasure in what we used to have pleasure in. Thank God for that. No more pleasure in sin. Though the pleasure we get now as a child of God is righteousness. That's our pleasure. Love, the love of God. Loving him, loving us. That's our pleasure. 
Our pleasure is found in his word. Our pleasure is found being in his presence. That's where our pleasure is. Hallelujah. That's what we find pleasure in. We don't find pleasure in the old things anymore. And get this, the pleasure of sin is broken through what Christ did at the cross. And then one day when you and I are raptured, even the presence of sin is going to be removed. Mm. And as Christ is, so will we be in every way. Spirit, soul, and body will be perfect as Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That law of sin and death basically is that spiritual law that says, because Adam sinned, you're a sinner. And, and we're all born in it. You don't have a choice in it. You're born in it, and you're a captive to sin. That's what the law of sin says. You're a captive to sin, and you are bound to die. You're, you have a death sentence on your life. That's what the law of sin and death says. You are bound by sin's power, its penalty, its pleasure, and its presence. You're bound by sin. The sin nature, you're bound by it. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he makes you free from that law. You see, the only law that is more powerful than the law of sin and death is the spiritual law of what Christ did for you at the cross. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's the only law that's more powerful than the law of sin and death. And actually what it does is it supersedes it supersedes the law of sin and death. Mm. It says, and doesn't take it away completely because we still, we're still, we're, you know what? Before the rapture takes place, we're, this body is dying and it's all because of sin. Why am I getting more gray hair? What am I bones ache how come i don't have the endurance i used to have when i was younger i don't have, how come i can't touch the basketball rim anymore <laughs> because i'm aging i'm getting old ultimately because of sin not not personal sin but because of adam's sin but christ makes us free he sets us free and he makes us free hallelujah praise god I just want to encourage you tonight, you are free in Christ. Declare it, believe it, know it, even when you don't feel it, you are. And you declare it, you know it over your life. I'm free in Christ. I've been redeemed. Hallelujah. I've been redeemed. I've been bought back from sin. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask that, Lord, you would make your freedom so real to your people. Lord, make, Lord, if they don't know you, if there's someone watching right now that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they would acknowledge that they're a sinner before you and ask that you would come into their heart, wash them clean from their sins, and set them free. Make them a new person. Make them free indeed. Hallelujah. Lord, we ask you to do that right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, that your freedom again would be made real by your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit, Lord, makes this, makes this real. Lord, intellectualism, just talking, just saying words doesn't make it real. Only the Holy Spirit can make your freedom real, Father. I ask that you would make it real to us, Lord, by your Spirit, through your Word. And we say it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you tonight. It's dark outside. I've got a little light right here. So if it looks that way, it's because of there is. So God bless you. We love you more than anything. God loves you. He cares for you. Have a wonderful evening in Christ Jesus.